Thank you very much, uh, President Benson and um, and Debbie, uh, for the great dinner last night and for inviting me here. <clears throat> my mother used to say that uh, when she heard uh, my uh, resume, that it seemed like a resume of a migrant worker with a BA degree. Um, <laughs> So German literature, um, I am either the uh, the cautionary tale for people going into uh, liberal arts or I'm the poster child for a, a good liberal arts uh, education. I'll let you be the decider of, of which that is. Uh, coming here tonight, I, I was reminded of the story of uh, Horace Albright, who was then the deputy director of the National Park Service and the creation of Zion National Park. In 1917, uh, Albright had been um, invited by Douglas White, who was an official of the Los Angeles and Salt Lake Railroad, uh, to come to southern Utah to visit Makuntaweep National Monument, which White believed was an undiscovered jewel in the loose string of scenic wonders that uh, Albright and his boss, Stephen Mather, were trying to mold into a unified system of national parks. Albright joined White in Los Angeles and took the train to Lund, uh, the closest station to here at the time, 35 rough miles, which they then covered by car. And along the way from uh, the station to Cedar City, White scolded Albright that McCuntaweep National Monument was being neglected and overlooked by officials in Washington. It had a budget of $120 a year and paid a salary of $1 a month for its custodian. He said the Park Service needed to invest more in upgrading the monument's facilities and in put more effort into its promotion, and he said that he was sure that many of the people in Cedar City would support it becoming a full-fledged national park. What he didn't tell Albright was that he had invited many of those people to come hear the deputy director of the National Park Service talk about his plans for McCuntaweep. <laughs> so sure enough, when Albright's car pulled into Cedar City, a large crowd had gathered in the center of town waiting to hear him speak and a little flustered by this surprise because he didn't know he was being expected to speak. Um, Albright nonetheless climbed up into the back of the big touring car that he was in and gave, as he recalled later, quote, a rousing impromptu speech about the National Park Service and about the beauties of Utah. What Albright didn't mention in that rousing speech was that he'd never been to Utah before. <laughs> So I'm going to return to Horace Albright in a moment, but I just wanted to assure you that I have been to Utah before many times. My wife, Diane, still considers Bryce Canyon as one of her favorite national parks, and I've had many, many unforgettable experiences all over this beautiful state, and it's good to be back. And I also want to thank, besides uh, President Benson and his wife, uh, Janet, Sig Miller and John I uh, for their work in bringing me here to Camille Bradford and other Driggs relatives for their role in this whole series and for mine being here. Uh, a little shout out to the students who came to some of the classes and uh, resisted falling asleep while I was speaking. I appreciated that. I know you're here because you have to get be here if you're going to get the extra credit that you're teachers did. I fully understand that. Anything to get a crowd. Um, and I would also like to ask if there are people here who work for or have in the past worked for the National Park Service to please stand up. Uh, I, on behalf of Everyone here and the American people, I want to thank you for the work that you do to uh, protect the treasures that are entrusted to you. As I told some people last night and, uh, and today, one of the great surprise honors for me was in April of 2009 at the uh, Auditorium of the Interior Department in Washington, D.C., when the director of the National 
Park Service bestowed upon both Ken Burns and myself uh, the title of Honorary Park Ranger, which has been bestowed on about 50 people, and, and a number of them are dead presidents. So I felt I was in <laughs> very lofty, lofty uh, company. And uh, the great thing, besides the certificate that I got, is I got the hat, you know, with the with the flat brim, and um, which we have in our in our house. And uh, whenever I get crabby or grumpy, then Diane goes and gets the ranger hat. Or, my, or if my kids are home, they'll get it and bring it over and put the hat on me because they know that it's, I can't be grumpy when I'm wearing my honorary ranger hat. So I salute my fellow rangers. Um, I want to uh, recognize Ryan Paul, who is here, uh, who works at the Frontier um, Homestead State Park. Ryan helped us in some of the research that we were doing when we were putting our film together. And Ryan, will you stand up, wave your hand, or... Something. That, thank you very much. And I'm very honored that here tonight is a, a person that um, I had the great honor to interview on camera for our film in the home of the uh, superintendent of Zion National Park, because, as he said in his interview, in which uh, portions of which we use in our film, he grew up with the park. Uh, Mr. J.L. Crawford, who is here. Um, if, if you don't know Mr. Crawford's uh, story, uh, I was going to say, if you don't know his story, then you, know, you should buy the DVD of our film, and I'm not going to tell you where it is. You've got to watch out 12 hours. Um, <laughs> he was born in a homestead that is on the site now of where the visitor center, I think the old visitor center used to be. He grew up watching the first tourists coming into Zion National Park, wash dishes at the Zion Lodge, and used to listen in afterwards at the, at the uh, interpretive talks that rangers would give and think, boy, wouldn't it be great someday to be a park ranger? And after he came back, after serving his country in World War II, he did become an interpretive park ranger for Bryce and for Zion National Park, um, and is still very active uh, uh, in, uh, he, he retired just about a year ago, I think. Um, he's still very active with the, with the park, a great inspiration to people to know about what he gave to the park and, and how he continues to give to it. And, and one of my favorite moments in, in our film is when he is talking about his clear, uh, unabashed affection for, for Zion. So thank you for, for being here, Mr. Crawford. Um, in the course of more than a quarter of a century of making documentary films for PBS, we at Florentine Films have presented the pageant of American history through a variety of prisms. In a long list of biographical films, we looked in great detail at the lives and times of significant Americans, from one of the nation's founders, Thomas Jefferson, to the first black heavyweight boxing champion, Jack Johnson, from the intrepid explorers, Lewis and Clark, to the path-breaking suffragists, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, from architects, Frank Lloyd Wright, to artists, Thomas Hart Benton, from politicians, Huey Long, to novelists, Mark Twain. We've probed aspects of the American character through films on two iconic landmarks, the Statue of Liberty and the Brooklyn Bridge, two transformative inventions, radio and the automobile, a religious sect, the Shakers, and an institution at the bedrock of our democracy, the Congress. We have followed the nation into its two most cataclysmic conflicts, the Civil War and World War II. And through a group of multi-episode series, baseball, jazz, the West, we have examined the longer sweep of our nation's history, always searching for new ways to answer a simple yet elusive question. Who are we, Americans? Who are we? Most recently, for uh, nearly 10 years, that search took us back and forth across this remarkable continent to some of its most beautiful places, including a number near here, 
in pursuit of the story of the national parks and what that story might tell us about these people who call themselves Americans and what a journey it was. Can I just state right here that I have the best job in America? Uh, I have believed that for a long time, but I really knew it was true when I started on the project of the national parks, because just think about it. For nearly a decade, my job required me to travel to all 58 of the national parks, to meet the people who knew the most about them, to learn how they had been created, to discover the stories we would want to tell, and to scout the locations we would want to shoot. And then my job required me to come back to those places with a camera crew, to capture on film the most beautiful places on earth in the most beautiful moments of the day, at dawn and at dusk. And that's right, for all those years, a condition of my employment was to spend as much time as possible in places like Zion and Bryce, here in Utah, or Canyon Lands and Arches and Capitol Reef, and much farther afield from the Everglades in Florida to the gates of the Arctic in Alaska, from the tranquil shores of Acadia on an island off the coast of Maine to the volcanoes, some dormant and one very, very active one on the islands of Hawaii from the lowest and hottest location in the hemisphere at the bottom of Death Valley to the highest point on the continent, more than 20,000 spectacular feet above sea level, a mountain so massive it creates its own weather. We call it Mount McKinley, but its older and more appropriate name is Denali, the high one. I went from standing in the middle of California forests of sequoia trees, the largest living things on earth, and then redwoods, the tallest living things on earth, to camping on a mountaintop not all that far from here in Nevada's Great Basin National Park, near a grove of bristlecone pines, the oldest living things on earth, trees that were alive and already, you know, half of their life had been lived by the time of Christ trees that were saplings and growing before Rome had conquered the known world, before the Greeks worshipped in the Parthenon, before the Egyptians built the pyramids. Those trees, some of them, were already growing on those mountaintops not that far from here. I made sure that our camera crew, <clears throat> I brought my son Will with me and I said, Will, take a picture of me next to one of these bristlecone pines so you, you can have a write a caption, Dayton Duncan, comma, next to the oldest living thing on earth. <laughs> Depends on where you punctuate it. That, uh, <laughs> think about it. Um, my job took me to Yellowstone, the first national park in human history, a geological wonderland with mud that boils and holes that spout steam hundreds of feet into the air, the greatest collection of geysers in the world, and of course to a mile deep gash in the ground not all that far from here, the grandest canyon on earth, where the Hopis say the first people emerged from the underworld, and where scientists say a river has patiently carved its way to expose rocks that are 1.7 billion years old, uh, Pre-Cambrian Vishnu Schist, and I would posit that we're the only film company in America that's ever gotten that, those words into a documentary film. <laughs> Pre-Cambrian Vishnu Schist, 1.7 billion years old, nearly half the age of the planet itself. That was the first part of my job, and the next part was to try to put it all together in a script and then turn it into a film, and doing all of that with my best friend, Ken Burns, who just happens to be the best filmmaker in America. And now you know why I say that I do have the best job in the nation. If somebody disputes that, we can talk about it later. <laughs>